Hi, I'm Glyn Jewis and I'm a portrait photographer based in the UK. And in this session, what I'd like to do is take you through kind of like the behind the scenes of a portraits project that I've been working on since around about the beginning of 2019. And this is a project that I kind of came up with as a way of saying thank you to our surviving World War II veterans for all that they did for our freedom all those years ago. Now, it's called the, the 39 to 45 Portraits Project. And in a nutshell, basically, before the lockdown and restrictions came into place that we've all been living amongst over these past few months, I was touring the UK, meeting these veterans at their homes and photographing them to give them a classic, timeless portrait, completely free of charge, that they could have and then could remain in their families for generations to come. It was, it was my way of saying thank you. But I want to take you behind the scenes. So first of all, let me just talk about briefly how this project even came about. Because as somebody who's always had an interest in World War II and the history uh, behind it all, um, I didn't even know about doing this project until I saw this film. Now, this is a film that was certainly uh, shown at the big screen in the UK. I'm not too sure if you'd have seen this uh, where you are, but uh, it's basically called Dad's Army, which was the nickname given to a group of people across the country that were known as the Home Guard. And these were people that were too old, too young, or not well enough or fit enough to go and fight on the front line. So they would remain at home to protect the towns, the villages and the cities, uh, just in case of any possible invasion. So I went to see this film and I remember coming out of it and a few days later speaking to a very good friend of mine saying, I would love to photograph people like that. Real characters, you know, proper characters, rather than me always looking for a model or a friend of a friend, uh, organising studio time, thinking of a uh, kind of like a, um, a scenario and the settings and clothing and posing, which I was terrible at. I just wanted to photograph real people and real characters. And my friend Barry said to me, you do realise there is a local group here? Because at the moment I live in Oxford, just in, in the UK. And he said, there is a local group called the Oxfordshire Home Guard Living History Group. Now, I'd never heard of this group, but I kind of went online. I found them, of all places, on Facebook. And I got in touch and said, look, I'm a photographer. This is who I am. This is where you'll find my books and videos and so on and so forth. Um, to kind of show that I wasn't some kind of weirdo who just turned up from nowhere. And I said, I'd love to come and meet you and possibly photograph you. And they are really, really gracious. And they said, by all means, come along. They actually have meetings twice a month on a Wednesday, about 20 minutes away from where I currently live. So I went along to see them. But before I went to see them, I was, I was all excited. But then I started to have a little bit of a wobble because I was thinking... These people do this year in, year out. They really know their stuff. They go to schools, they do exhibitions, memorials, they do shows. They live, eat, breathe, sleep the 40s. So I started to think if that's what they do, they would have been photographed a lot of times. Why on earth would they even entertain me? Why would they even think that what I'm going to do is any different to what they've already had done many times in the past? So what I did was, and this worked really, really well, I went online and found photographs by photographers whose work I absolutely love. And two of those people in particular, you've got Yusuf Karsh, who took the iconic portrait there of Winston Churchill, and then you've got Annie Leibovitz. I absolutely love their work. So I got these pictures and I put them onto my iPad. Now, the reason I did that was because these pictures beautiful as they are they were kind of like this was the kind of feel that I wanted to be able to say to them this is this is what I want to do with you rather than me ex try to verbally explain it I wanted to show them so I got these on my iPad I went to go and see these people for the first time and unexpectedly they made me stand up and give like a five minute presentation to say what I wanted to do and sure enough as I was talking to them you could kind of see in their faces even though they were listening they were still thinking, this is just going to be exactly like everything we've had done before. Until I got my iPad out and said, this is what I want to do with you. This kind of thing here. And then it was almost like night and day difference. You could just see the change in them. Now they could see the kind of thing they were going to get. And it became not just me that was interested now and excited about the shoot. They were too. And you could hear the mutterings going on around the table. Oh, I like that. Oh, that's very nice. Oh, yeah, yeah. So sure enough, I knew I've got them. I've won them over. Now they can physically see what I want to do. We actually organized so that the following meeting they had, which was two weeks later, I went along and we actually did the photo shoot after they'd done their kind of roll call and their meetings and their drill practice and what have you. 
So we started to set up and do these pictures for the very first time. And what I really enjoyed about this, this was kind of like the first time for me as a photographer that I really, really enjoyed my photography because I'd kept the setup, the lighting, the background, all that kind of stuff, really, really simple. And that was just a case of one light being used. And I'll show you in the next slide the back, the kind of setup that I was using. But the big thing about this was the fact that I wasn't thinking about the technicals. Because I'd kept it simple and practiced it over and over again, I was able to just relate to the people I was photographing. And that made a huge, huge difference. In this slide here, you can see the kind of setup I was using. At the time, I was using like gray paper because, well, number one, it was cheap, but also in Photoshop, I can very easily change that background by adding a texture to it and just using a blend mode. I can give it a completely different look Best of all, I guess that's for free as well because I could take pictures using my phone. But you can see there the lights on one side to the front of the subject and that's going to give you like a, a cross lighting effect uh, where you're going to have the nearest side of their face will be lit and the side furthest away from the light will be in shadow. But if you do alter the height of that light, keep it in the same place but alter the height and then play around with the angle of it, you can actually create that Rembrandt style of lighting where on the shadow side of the face, you have that triangular pattern of light landing on the cheek just directly below the eye. So it's a classic timeless portrait. And I was absolutely loving this stuff. It was simple. I was able to have fun with the people I was photographing. I mean, every day I was seeing these people. It was like every day was a school day. I was, you could see in the picture here, they were bringing all manner of artifacts along. I remember the one time Brian, who's the guy sat down here, he brought along a gramophone record player. And he explained to me the old saying that, I don't know if you folks have this, but we certainly did in the UK, that years ago, when you wanted someone to shut up, basically, you would say, oh, put a sock in it. And I never knew where that came from. But Brian explained to me it came from when they used to have the gramophone record players that didn't have a volume control. So you quite literally would put a sock in it to dampen the volume down. So every day was a school day. But another great thing about this whole starting off this particular project here was the fact that when we did photo shoots indoors or outdoors, I realized that the technicals didn't need to change. My mindset at the time of kind of starting this, or maybe just before, it was the fact that I seemed to feel that every photo shoot I did, I had to do something technically different to show that I was kind of changing things and, and not sort of sticking to the same old, same old. But what I very quickly learned was it's not the technicals that need to change, it's the content. You know, if you keep doing this uh, kind of setup, if you get a preferred lighting style that's going to kind of be your signature thing, it becomes so comfortable with it. I mean, there is always more to learn, obviously, but you become very, very comfortable with it and you can kind of use it in no matter what location you are. And if you have to adapt, you can adapt because you know about that lighting style. And it's the same one here with this guy called Chris who plays the role of a dispatch rider because his dad was a, a dispatch rider during the war, but the lighting exactly the same. That one light, that octa to the side and further forward of the subject to give that cross lighting, Rembrandt kind of lighting kind of thing. And you can just tell by looking at Chris's face here that the light was camera left because that's the side of his face that is predominantly lit. But I started to do more and more of this kind of stuff. And I remember we organized all kinds of photo shoots. One in particular is this one you can see here. Uh, I thought it'd be a great idea to do a picture of a young boy that had been billeted during wartime, which is where the children were taken away from the cities and towns that were suffering all the bombing. And they were sent away to go and live with families that they didn't know but to live in relative safety in the countryside, okay? So I thought that'd be a good idea to do. But it was kind of whilst doing this that the idea for my 39 to 45 project came about because while I was really, really enjoying my photography now, it's just becoming such fun. You know I mean? I wasn't stressing out about it. I was just really, really enjoying it. I couldn't get the camera in my hand often enough. I suddenly had this idea that, do you know what I would ultimately love to do as a photographer who's interested in the war? I would love to be able to photograph surviving World War II veterans. And like I said at the start, to be able to give them and their families a classic timeless portrait, like the ones I've kind of shown you already, that can remain in their family for years to come to remember that relative for what they did. Okay. So I, again, I turned to the internet and I found a group on Facebook of all places called the Normandy Veterans Family and Friends. And I put a message in there explaining what it was that I wanted to do. Vid visit uh, our veterans, male and female, to photograph them, to give them these portraits. And obviously with that, 
you know, there comes a lot of trust. But thankfully, one lady did put her trust in me. And it was a lady called Jane Barkway Harney, who is, I believe she's the president of the Glider Pilots Association from the Army Air Corps. And she introduced me to this gentleman here called Laurie Whedon, who himself a legend, absolute legend. Laurie was a staff sergeant in the Glider Pilot Regiment who piloted the Horsa Glider, the same engineless aircraft that were towed behind the Dakotas or the Halifaxes, uh, and they had all these soldiers in the back there. Once they were released from that cable, they were committed. They were going into the war zone. They're the same gliders that landed at 20 past 12 in the morning uh, on the 6th of June, 1944, to take hold of Pegasus Bridge. Also the same gliders that landed in places like the Netherlands for Operation Market Garden. I mean, these were seriously, seriously brave, uh, incredible people. Meeting Laurie was, I was a little bit speechless because it was like me, meeting a movie hero. I mean, I'd never, I'd never known a veteran. You know, my granddad obviously was a veteran, but he died in 86, 1986. And I wasn't even doing this kind of stuff then. So to meet and spend time with Laurie was wonderful. But as is pretty much the case with every single portrait that I've taken in this series, there comes uh, the limit of space. I've never photographed a veteran yet where I've had too, too much of it. And this is the great thing about doing the same kind of lighting setup again and again and again so that you can adapt it to the environment you're in. I mean, you can see here, this is the, the typical setup when I was photographing Laurie. We've got my simple background. That's a Westcott background. Uh, very light, very portable, which is what I need. I need to have kit here because I'm traveling around that's light, portable, uh, quick and easy to set up. So you've got my background. You can see the light there as well. Uh, I've got a speed light. This is all I'm using is a four double out battery speed light on these pictures here into a Westcott softbox. Uh, and then you can see I've got my camera on the tripod and I'm above the camera. I never go behind the camera. I'll explain about that in a moment. But a really, really small setup. I mean, this one here with Laurie, I ended up taking the picture in the galley of his kitchen. You know, but just the great thing again, like I say, it's a small footprint. We can work it wherever we need to work it. Here's got a picture when I'm taking a behind the scenes picture of when I'm photographing a veteran called Reg Charles. Uh, and again, you can see I've got the background there. That was actually a heavier background there. And there was there was a moment when that nearly cost me a lot of money because as I put the background up I remember turning around and I'd I'd only set it up on a boom arm and I hadn't yet put the sandbags on the stand to support it and as I turned away this stand started to fall over and by the side of Reg's television he used to have used to have a ceramic poppy and he's one of the many thousands of poppies that had been on display outside the Tower of London um, and it almost fell over and broke it so I ended up changing the background to the Westcott background but you can see here I am above the camera. And the reason for that is so that I can maintain eye contact with the person. I did find very quickly that if I start to hide behind the camera, that then puts the person, certainly the veteran, who I guess it's fair to say they're not really keen on having the photograph taken, but they're doing it because they know the reason for doing it. Um, I find if I went behind the camera, it would then make them feel a little bit more anxious. So I just maintain that eye contact, keep the conversation going, and I find it's a much better way to continue that engagement, but to ensure that you get the good picture. We can see here, this is when I uh, took the picture back to Reg, because this is one thing I've been doing with this project is as well. It's, it's way more than just a photography project. This is kind of like me making friends. I never wanted to be the person that would just go in, get what he wanted, never to be seen again. So I always return to give them a print and it's always mounted. And I mean, this one here you can see of Reg, it's obviously framed, which is a considerable, much more investment, but there is a reason for that. I won't go into the details, but basically Reg, if fair to say, has changed my life for the better uh, because of something that he kind of explained to me when I went back to see him the second time he talked about forgiveness and stuff like that. And consequently, I am now back in touch with uh, members of my family that I hadn't seen for 16 years up until the point of meeting Reg. So yeah, loads of benefits to projects. Some of them you never, never expect. Um, in this picture here, you can see I'm photographing another guy. This is a guy called Len Fox, who himself was a dispatch rider. But you can see clearly here that I am shooting tethered. And that is really, really important to me so that I can see things coming through nice and big, and I know that I'm getting the shots that I need. Now, that's important anyway, regardless of what photo shoot that you're doing, but if I'm being perfectly honest and blunt with you, this is something, certainly with this project, that I need to make sure that I get first time round with no issues, no hiccups, no nothing. I need to make sure I get this shot done properly at the time, because 
for all we know, I may never have the opportunity to go back and take that picture. And I think you kind of know what I'm what I'm suggesting there. Um, but you can see here, I'm above the camera. The I've got my camera plugged into my computer so I can see everything coming through. And I tend to use Capture One quite a lot there for doing the tethering because I find it really, really stable and fast when it comes to tethering. Now, one of the guys I photographed when I was actually at that particular shoot there, that was actually at a pub of all places, a great place to do a photo shoot, was this man here. And this is a guy called Alan King. And I remember kneeling down in front of Alan. And I was kind of adjusting his medals to make sure that everything was okay before we did the photo shoot. And I said to him, Alan, what's that little badge that you've got here, or that patch on your left arm? And he explained to me that that was called, well, it's it a seahorse, but he said they called it the pregnant prawn because of the pose of it. And he then went on to tell me, kind of very matter of fact, that that was given to the soldiers who were the first ones to land on the beaches on D-Day, the first wave, which is incredible in itself. But even more so that he just carried on to tell me that they were told they had roughly 20 minutes to live. And he just kind of said it like it was nothing. And I remember saying to him, Alan, how? I said, what? How on earth can you deal with that when you're 19, 20 years of age? How do you mentally deal with that? You're being told that you're going on to do this particular task, but they reckon that you're not going to live more than 20 minutes. And he says, well, to be honest with you, you know, we wanted to get off the landing craft onto the beach. He said, because the sea was so rough, everyone was around you being ill and sick. He said, we wanted to get onto relatively firm ground. I just thought that was absolutely incredible. Uh, this guy here has become a very, very good friend of mine. This is a guy called Jim uh, Hooper, who himself was also a horse glider pilot in the Army Air Corps. Now, the reason I show you this picture here is to kind of talk about how we adapt to the people that we photograph. You have to treat everybody on a case-by-case -case basis. And Jim is certainly no exception to this because in his early 90s, I mean, I, think, I believe Jim is now 98, 97, 98. In his early 90s, he started to lose his eyesight. Not completely, but to the point that now he only really sees kind of shadow, shapes, and, and highlights. Um, consequently, he now lives at a place called the Blind Veterans Centre, which is in an area called Brighton on the coast in the UK. Great place that does uh, wonderful stuff for veterans. Um, but when I went to go and photograph Jim, bearing in mind now about his sight and the issues that he has, one of the things I made sure to do was position it so that when I'm taking Jim's photographs, I was in the window photographing into the room so all the white you know the bright light behind me was all around from the outside so to Jim when he's looking back at me I'm a silhouette and that was really important because like I say he can only see shadows and highlights so when I need Jim to kind of maybe turn his face in a certain direction when I move my hand and say Jim you know look at my hand follow it around he can see the shape moving because it's silhouetted against that window so then he can kind of move around and follow it. So that's one of the things there that, just an example really, I guess, of how you kind of cater for people's needs rather than kind of treating everybody the same and going in there saying, right, by the end of this shoot, I will have a seated portrait, a close-up portrait and an interview. Sometimes you just can't do that, but you do need to adapt to people. And I guess this next person here is a, is a perfect example of that. This is a veteran called John Sleep who was in the Parachute Regiment. And I've met John many, many times. John is 99 years of age, and he is just an incredible, incredible man. But the thing about John is whenever you see him and when you go and speak to him, it almost seems like he's, he's literally that close to crying every single time. And the reason for that is that John, pretty much all of his life since the war, has suffered with post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. And this all comes from what he experienced during the war. And... Long story short is that John told me that when he was in uh, the Netherlands, he said he was walking along the grass bank uh, of a dike. And as he's walking along the grass bank, uh, he sees a building over on the left-hand side. And next to it uh, is a tree, or what he thinks is a tree. And as he gets closer and closer to it, he realises that it's not a tree, but a German tank with camouflage on it. And instinctively, John's just grabbed his Bren gun and fired a few shots at the tank. The tank then unfortunately came alive and the turret has turned to face John and it fired a shell and that shell landed in the grass bank directly beneath John's feet and consequently blew him up. Uh, horrific, horrific injuries. And he ended up going from one hospital to the next, to the next, to the next, until eventually he was brought back to UK shores. 
Now, the reason that he went from hospital to hospital to hospital wasn't necessarily because of the injuries that he suffered, but because of his behaviour whilst he was at the hospitals. He was shouting, swearing, verbally abusive, physically abusive, you name it, he was doing it. And they couldn't cope with it, so they moved him from one hospital to the other. The really sad thing is that John didn't know he was doing it. He was doing this during his sleep. But what's really, really sad is that John told me that in late life, you know, in his 90s, when his wife was still alive, he said they would regularly wake up in the morning together and his wife would turn to him and say, you were in the army again last night, John. So even in his late 90s, John suffered or suffers with post-traumatic stress disorder, which I think is incredible. Now, the reason I tell you that is because knowing that, my feelings were that was that I couldn't just go in and photograph John in any old way like I normally would do. I had to adapt to it. I mean, for example, I've already told you that I would use a, a flash, a 4AA battery flash or the, or the FJ400 that I use now as well from Westcott because it does TTL and what have you. My thoughts were maybe I can't use a flash because I don't actually know how John is going to react if a flash goes off. So what I did was, and this is something that I always have with me, I, I, I brought in a daylight balanced video light, a constant light. So I, rather than using the flash, I used that, put it into the modifier and positioned it so that whilst John was sitting, I could see the lighting pattern was exactly how I wanted it to be, like it would be had I used, you know, the normal flash. So then when we do the photo shoot, there's not going to be a flash going off. Now, I did also make some changes in the camera and that was the fact that once I put it on the tripod, I then activated the silent shutter, which is something that's available in a lot of cameras these days. Really handy for wedding photographers so that they don't hear this loud clicking going on in the church during the ceremony, but brilliant for doing stuff like I was doing now with John. Because now I've activated the silent shutter, I also turned on the face tracking and continuous focus. And the last thing I did was I plugged in a cable release into the camera. And the reason for that was when I'm doing the photo shoot, the light is on John. I, what you see is what you get. I can see exactly that. There's going to be no click. So not only is he not going to see a flash, he's not going to hear a click. So he doesn't know when his picture is being taken. But also I've got the cable release. So as I'm talking to John and he's kind of talking back at me, with out of sight, I'm pressing the shutter at what I think is the right moment to get the right picture of him. And I remember doing it. I got John to, uh, I said to John, tell me about the parachute regiment, John. What was it like to train to be a para? I didn't want to talk about all the horrible stuff. So John's then talking to me about the training and how hard it was and the things they did. But whilst he's doing that, out of sight from John, I'm doing this and I'm taking his picture. And that was brilliant. He didn't even know we were doing it. But not only that, what was great about it was as well, was that I, I was capturing real expressions. Whilst John was telling me all this stuff about the parachute regiment, you could see that he could see it in his head. And that really came through in the portraits that we did. So that's definitely something to try. Um, if you feel that maybe you're photographing somebody that may have issues like John, or maybe somebody that's just incredibly nervous. And you can kind of be a little bit covert, a little bit sneaky there getting the portraits done. But it really, really, really works. This picture here is of a guy called Tom Schaefer. I mean, what a face. What an amazing face. How could you not photograph this man? wonderful moustache and his his personality his character is every bit you what you'd expect it to be when you look at his face he is such a wonderful man tom but the reason i show you this is look at the picture in the bottom left there of the frame that is where i photographed tom at his house in london beautiful house but way too much furniture and there was hardly any space this was probably the hardest photo shoot i've had in all my time as a photographer because of the lack of space. So much so that when I had my camera on the tripod, I couldn't even get behind it so that I could go above and maintain that eye contact. I had to put the camera on the tripod, but lean the camera back so that the back of it was pressed up against the wall. And I'm to the side of the camera pressing the remote like this, the old cable and uh, the shutter like this. Thankfully, again, where the technology and where kit can really help you out. Thankfully, I'm tethered so I can see everything coming in to the big screen. And thankfully, we've got stuff like face tracking, eye focus, and all those amazing bits of technology now that you know really do come into their own. Thankfully, that was able to lock onto Tom's face while I couldn't get behind the camera, so I knew that I'd nailed the shot. Absolutely nailed it. So that's just brilliant. Real great use of technology. This guy here is a guy called George Avery. And the reason I explained to you about George Avery, again, talking about how we adapt to people's needs and each photo shoot. 
When I was originally contacted about photographing George for the project, his daughter Catherine told me that uh, her dad suffers with quite advanced stages of dementia and she was concerned whether or not we'd even managed to get a portrait of him because of the way that his dementia shows himself, shows itself. You know, one moment he'll be this 98-year-old sweet man. The next moment, all of a sudden, he'll become like a spoiled child. And I don't, don't say that in any way disrespectfully. It's just the way that his character just suddenly changes. He'll have this really over-the-top smile. Then all of a sudden, he'll have a really moody-looking face. And he'll laugh and really, really jumps about. But with, with George, you know, my attitude was, yes, we can do this. But again, we have to approach it in a certain way. So what I did with George was the exact same setup. But I just did more pictures. And I don't mean that I kind of blasted him with pictures. We did more pictures. So the same pace, but did more of them. And the reason for that was what I found was I would get a great expression of George where George didn't look like he was unwell. But at the same time, his pose wouldn't be right because of the way that he was behaving. But then on the other side, I would find I'd get a great pose of George, but then his expression wasn't right. So this is where I guess a little bit of poetic license comes in because what I did then uh, in the computer was do a head swap, you know, where I'd get a great expression of George, the perfect pose, put the two together. And there are, you know, there are people that would go, oh, that's cheating. You can't do that. But I'll be honest with you, I couldn't care less because the idea of this project is to give people portraits that they can proudly look at in years to come, rather than me giving them a picture of George as he was for them to look at and go, that's when dad wasn't well. That's the last thing I want. So if I have to do a head swap, then great. This is, you know, this is modern day. This is just doing what needs to be done as far as I'm concerned. Now, I think it, it's fair to say there are certain people, it's only human nature, that you connect more with than others. You know, that's no disrespect to anybody else, but you do just naturally connect with some people more than others. And this guy here, this is a veteran called David Edwards, who's from Wales. And I'm, I, I love this man. I love his wife, his son, Chris. They've made me feel so incredibly welcome. Photographing David and becoming great friends with David has been an absolute pleasure. And you can see here when I've kind of, this is a picture to show the behind the scenes when I'm photographing him. It was just such fun doing it. And again, you can see there, camera in the foreground, that tether tools cable has to be done because I need to make sure that I get this. But also you can see when I've gone back and given David his portrait. I mean, what a wonderful man. But I want to show you a short video now, really short video. But this is when I uh, went back to see David to give him his portrait. So this was the second time I'd met him, but I went back to give him his framed print. And this is the reaction I got from David and his wife, Diane, when they saw the picture. And for me, as a photographer, it just doesn't get better than this. This is the reaction that money cannot buy. But every time I see this, it reminds me of why I do what I do. <laughs> Nobody's seen it yet, apart from me. All right, and do you want to have a, have a look at it then? Turn it over. Oh, my God. Gosh. Oh, boy, that's a portrait. That's a real one. That is brilliant. Lovely, isn't it? You've even got that cheeky, silly look about it. It's like it. a painting. It's lovely. Oh, just look at that. <laughs> Family. I can't get over it. Even your tiny at an angle. <laughs> look at it. My nicest just... photograph I've ever had to. He's in tears now. Oh, bless. Yeah, look at that. It was worth all the work, wasn't it? It was worth the second visit. It was worth the second visit, definitely. I can see but you've got his, his hands as well, it's so good. I used to do a lot of painting. Uh -huh. And very often, it's more, you know better than me, it's more important what you leave out than what you put in, isn't it? That's it. It's gorgeous. But look at the arms and the uh, chairs. And this through there. fades away there, look. It's lovely. And there, and your point of interest point comes of on there. Point of interest is your face. Lovely, yeah. Now, you wouldn't be wrong there when you're kind of hearing his words that David's saying there, talking about it's fading out here and your point of interest is there. You think, he's using the same language that we use as photographers, and you'd be so, so right. David is an incredibly creative man. All of his life, he's done incredible landscape paintings, which are on display in his house. But also, he wrote poems, and so many poems. In fact, what I'd, I'd really urge you to do is to go to the project website, 3945portraits.com. If you go on the education link, you'll see a little post I've put together there of a poem that David did because I recorded him reading his poem. 
put some music to it and some archive wartime footage. It is incredibly powerful called Normandy 44. I'd love you to go and check that out. But kind of uh, if we talk about, you know, uh, projects, we talk about taking these portraits of these veterans and then we talk about, you know, these restrictions that we've all been living under for the last you know few months where we've not been able to go out and take pictures of people. You know, what on earth do I do as a portrait photographer? I mean, there's only so many times I can photograph this mannequin head that you can see resting on the shelf uh, in my, my little office here. Or I can, only so many times I can photograph my wife. But what I decided to do was another project to keep the tools in my hand, to keep me creative, and also, I guess, to sort of fight off a little bit of the cabin fever. Uh, I started to do these ones here, these, these Airfix models. Now, I never did, this, did these as a, as a kid, but I've thoroughly enjoyed doing this because it's helped me to be, you know, keep the creativity going. Putting them together, I've, I've used way too much glue, but I think that's kind of normal when you're doing this kind of stuff. Painting them hasn't been the best, although I am getting better. But here you can see what I've also been doing is photographing them. So putting them on a little uh, tabletop tripod, photographing them on behind my other monitor. I've got a little BenQ monitor here. This is, for those of you interested, this is actually a, a, the SW321C. It's a brilliant monitor that doesn't have any kind of shine to it. It's a matte finish to it. So it's great for photographing against. Um, but you can see here in the bottom right-hand corner, there's my camera tethered into my laptops into Capture One so I can th see things coming in nice and big. And this is really important to me because photographing these really small models, I need to make sure that every point that I photograph them at is absolutely sharp and in focus. And because of, you can't just photograph them at a single aperture, you have to take multiple shots. So I'll photograph the nearest part, the middle part, and the furthest part. And then in, in Photoshop, we can use a thing called focus stacking to put them all together. So we have one image, which is sharp from front all the way through to the back. Uh, but you can see tethering there to, to do that. But I've thoroughly enjoyed doing this. It's, it's kind of pushed me as a photographer and a retoucher to kind of how would you know think how would i do this how would i do that how would i make propellers how would i work with highlights and shadows and stuff like that i mean this one here this is a lancaster bomber it's only about six inches wide um i made the background i photographed the actual lancaster on the tripod with the background behind it and then to do the actual highlights you can see here in the bottom right here this is the behind the scenes this is showing how i made the highlights on the lancaster just by using the video light and again shooting tethered i was able to check where everything needed to be so it kind of it might take that just a, you know a couple more minutes setting up but it saves you so much time later on uh did i've made a, a dakota from scratch i'll let you into a secret actually i only make the outside all the little bits are inside i've got boxes full of them because i only want to make the outside of it but don't tell anybody uh, so i did that one i did a horse a glider and this one here was really important for me to do for the lady called jane barkway harney that I've, I've talked about already if you look closely you can see the number 93 on this glider uh, this is one that again this is a little uh, model that i made up but the reason i put 93 on there was because this is actual glider called chalk 93 and this was a glider that was piloted by a guy, a guy called Jeff Barkway, Jane Barkway Harney's dad. He piloted Chalk 93, which was the second glider to land at 20 past 12 in the morning on the 6th of June 44 to take hold of Pegasus Bridge. Just iconic, absolutely iconic. So obviously I've given that to Jane. And this picture here, uh, a field near where I live, just came alive recently, recently with poppies. So I had to go and photograph it. I then took another picture of one of my little Spitfires on the tabletop there uh, and then put those two, two together. And this is now for my mom because two of her favorite things are poppies and Spitfires. She's veterans crazy. She absolutely loves the veterans. Um, but that's kind of all I wanted to talk to you about. You know, I wanted to give you an idea of what I've been doing uh, during lockdown, but also talked about the main project, which I'm, I'm so looking forward to the restrictions being lifted so that I can get out and photograph these veterans to continue giving them uh, the portraits so that they've got them for the rest of their lives and will remain in their families for you know generations to come. Uh, but that's me. I would love it if you could go and check those out. Like I've mentioned already, the website is 3945portraits.com and my main website is glindewis.com. Uh, guys, thank you so much. And I'll hopefully see you again soon.